they're not legislating at the moment. That's always considered to be a good thing. That the old joke is, when they're actually in session in Boise, it's the most dangerous time of year. <laughs> uh, so, State Senator Christy Sito, she's actually high atop her bunker, and uh, <laughs> and joining us this morning from uh, an undisclosed location. We'll just put it that way. Six minutes after nine o'clock, we're at thirty-five. Bill Colley. On Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 961 FM 1310 KLIX at News Radio 1310.com. We'll just say generally, uh, she's in Elmore County. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Bill Colley. Thank you for having me. Hey, right off the st- start, we we this, this was not on our agenda for today, but I was just chatting with Todd before he left, and subject came up about redistricting, and we we don't know that the f- final maps are complete yet. But the map, the way it's drawn, if it holds, it looks like it will actually strengthen you uh, with the with the, with the voting block because you'll be in territory stretching all the way over what to Custer County. That's what I understand. Um, I would get to campaign maybe with Dorothy Moon, and how does it get better than that? Yeah, the, the two of you. Um, at least to be a word, it's probably considered today to be uh, sort of a. <sighs> I think people, you know, you, you, there are certain words you can't describe women as any longer because it, it's not politically correct. But I would say the two of you are a little on the saucy side. Uh. That works. <laughs> I, I don't worry about political correctness because I think it's just a, a buzz phrase that's used to silence those who are bold. It is. It would be an interesting district, though, because I know that I had, I had actually talked to Representative Moon, and she thought that she would end up with Blaine County, and she said that will probably term limit me. But if it holds the way it is, it actually, uh, it's an advantage uh, for legislators. Uh, you know, your group is called, I guess, the Constitutional Wing. Uh, mainstream media has nastier terms, but it's called the Constitutional Wing. And it, it, if it holds in this particular way, uh, there might be a primary you have to get involved with against someone else, obviously. But if it does hold this way, uh, the, the, the district much better aligns with the views that the two of you have. I think so. That That's kind of the way it's looking. But, you know, we won't know until it's done. And then depending on how it's district and who is unhappy, of course, there will be challenges in the court. So, you know, I haven't – people talk to me about the redistricting and where it stands and what do I think. And I just held to the position that until I see it and it's done and we know what it is, it's, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time – I'm speculating on it because there are so many more things that are more pressing. It's it's one of those situations that there's not anything I can do about it anyway, but I will make the best out of the situation when we know what it is. I uh, we we talked the other day off off air, and I was bringing up uh, the media in this state, and again, I don't think that mainstream media seems to believe that it uh, it represents the values of Idahoans. I I. I just have to chuckle at that. They need to get a bigger circle of friends and, and get a better look at what the, what the rest of the state is like. But they have become much more shrill in how they describe, especially your wing of the party. And uh, and it's everything now is always far right wing. I think everything, of course, uh, you know, to the right of Karl Marx is right wing to them. Uh, but it, it just it, it it shows you uh, maybe it's their frustration. But the nastiness that that's going on with the way they report stories now about, and frankly, it's any Republican. It, it, you know, I I read where uh, somebody last week described Governor Little Little as far right, and then described Lieutenant Governor McGeehan as a fascist. So um, they, well, they can't it, help and it. And it changes. They they can't. And it changes moment to moment. Um, there are very few places in media now where you can actually get the truth. We we don't have. Remember when. Was at Fox News, they would say, we report, you decide, we'll give you the facts, and then you can go from there. And, you know, this has always been a challenge with the media for generations now. This this isn't something new. But what is different, Bill, I believe, is the visceral hate that we're seeing and the the literal censorship in in media now, even if even if we look at our social media, and you can say, well, you know, they're private organizations, they're private-owned businesses, they, they can censure and they can do as they please, and that's probably true, but we keep buying into it and we keep allowing it. Um, 
I don't see anybody who believes in your basic God-given rights as a far-right lunatic. I believe that's why we're here. I believe that's the proper role of government, to protect those rights. And I find it very, very unfortunate that those people who scream and holler the loudest and jump up and down and call names and ridicule those of us who really do stand for your rights, who really do believe that you have the right to individual and bodily autonomy, that we believe in state sovereignty, that we believe in the original intent of the Constitution and not the annotated, I don't even know how many thousands of pages that is. Can you explain to me how that is far right? I, just somebody give me a good reason why that is far right. I would think that would be the center that we should all start from. Yeah, you know, as a conservative, I guess I start from a particular position. Obviously, I think I'm, I'm right, <laughs> and I, I understand that other <laughs> well, people don't see it that way. That's a guy thing. Now that we're talking about men and women, that that's a guy thing. <laughs> yeah. <be> right. <laughs> well. But but it just you you point this out. The media no longer is. I even saw a piece in the Washington Post today from one of the columnists on the op-ed page, and she admitted that the, the newsrooms in this country have moved far to the left. So they're from their prism now. Everything that they see uh, is is just something that has to be smacked down. Uh, I, I just you know the other one was uh, was it Jim Jones now saying that we should have Democrats vote in primaries to eliminate the so-called far right. Mainstream media referred to him as a mainstream Republican. But even people I consider to be establishment or mainstream Republicans think that he's lost his mind. And and so that, that, that it shows you that there's almost right now, you must, you must be, your movement must be growing if this is the reaction from so many of these people. Well, you know, when, when people are worried that their position and what they want to accomplish isn't going to happen, that's when they get visceral and that's when they, you can always see that fear. I mean, you know, like if a varmint comes in my yard and he thinks he has a right to be there, but I know he doesn't because he's going to hurt my grandkids or eat my chickens, and I get him cornered, he's going to fight back even harder because he knows his days are numbered and that, you know, this is my place and I'm going to protect what I have. And that's what we see. And, you know, there are some people in, in Idaho politics that really should just retire. Um, they've either lost touch or or maybe didn't ever have touch. But, you know, it goes back to this, Bill, that we know what our basic rights are. We know the difference between right and wrong. And that line is trying to be really skewed. And we can't have that. We can't allow that. I want my grandkids to grow up in the world that I knew. Um, my stepdad is 89 years old, and we had the conversation just the other day. He rolled into Ogden with $7 and a pregnant wife. And in just a few years, he was able to build, he built the Utah Auto Auction. He had a trucking company. He was able to build hotels in foreign countries. He was able to buy property all on his own volition. And when we were talking about this, he said, you know, he said, in the world we live in today, no one will be able to do what I was fortunate enough to do. He said, no matter how hard a person works today, they are not going to be able to accomplish in a lifetime what I did and people like me did that were willing to work hard. And, you know, I, I've been really blessed to know a lot of really successful people who came from nothing, who, who were able to build build these businesses and 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 better the world. Um, I know a guy, he's, he's no longer with us, but he started out back in the days, you know, when they used to pump your gas. I don't know if anybody, how many people are alive that I, I remember still remember that. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he started out, he worked at a car dealership on one side of the road, and this was in the town I grew up in. And he would run across the street when customers would come in, and he would pump their gas, wash their window, and that's when they checked your oil, and there was this thing called customer service. And then, you know, he'd run back across the street and take care of his, the business over there. And he was able to build what at one time was the largest international truck dealership in the world. He had the lease on every garbage truck in the state of New York. And so, you know, this is the world that we want to leave our children, that if you're willing to work hard, you're willing to put it out there and invest in yourself and invest in the future, 
that, that we can accomplish these things. And every one of these people that I know, Bill, they go on to do wonderful things for the world. The guy who had the international dealer, he would put so much money into the junior colleges and into our communities, and he would buy thousands of dollars of worth of animals at the fairs. And, you know, he they just – when people have that kind of money and the government isn't in your pocket picking it every day – Americans take care of they take care of themselves they take care of the world when it's needed and we see that and that's the world that I know that I would like to leave and that's the world that I'm confident that people think <clears throat> excuse me think like me would like to leave and I don't know about your media company but we do know that 98% of the media in the United States are owned by the same conglomerate and so you can – you've seen those um, on TV where the buzzword, whatever the, the word for the day is, um, I'm trying to think of something, but that word is repeated over and over and over. That phrase is repeated over and over and over, even if it's a lie, on all of these media platforms, thinking that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth and people will believe it. And my hope and prayer is, is that there are enough people who will voice the truth, that there are enough people in our country left that will critically think that we're just, we're going to stand up and we're going to say no, like our Southwest airline pilots have done and the American airline pilots and many of our healthcare workers. You know, we're to that point now where seeing what we're coming from the federal government and the way that the sitting president of the United States speaks to the people in this country we are at a very critical crossroads, and today is the day that you will say, no more, I'm going to fight for my freedom and the freedom of my children and grandchildren, and I will peacefully resist, and I will peacefully say, no more, this is the line. got a question for you on a story that media is trying to gin up or generate. Uh, one of your former colleagues when you were in the House, uh, Tammy Nichols, posted a meme a couple of days ago. Uh, and I thought it was it's very, very funny. It's about a fictional show called, I never watched it, but it's called Walking Dead, where a character used a baseball bat to hit zombies. And uh, and it's meant to be funny. It's Donald Trump with a baseball bat, and then there's a number of liberal organizations in Idaho behind it. And, of course, immediate, immediately uh, mainstream media said, wow, she's advocating violence. And I sat down with a host of our pastor's roundtable program yesterday for lunch, and I mentioned this to them, and they they said, huh? What violence? And, and so, but they, they think somehow that they're going to be able to, by creating a story out of nothing like this, that they're somehow going to get some leverage and maybe remove somebody they view as an enemy of their own. Well, I would agree with you on that, but it's okay for a television, I believe she was a television talk show host, to stand there with um, a picture of, or some effigy of Donald Trump's head being severed from his body. And that's okay. See, that, that's the problem that we have. We, we are, that's another indication of just exactly where we are and the crossroads that we're standing. Freedom of speech is okay for you if you're saying what, what these media conglomerates want to have heard. But it's not okay for me if, if it's not what they want to have heard. Now, I saw the meme. I didn't think anything of it. Um, and even if I did, and I didn't, but even if I had thought, you know, that's not appropriate, it's not, you know, something that should be done, and I did not think that. I want it very clear. I did not think that. But that's freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And when we start trying to decide, you know, and there are lines that should not be crossed, you know, pornography in our open, but then watch TV, and I'm embarrassed. I don't even have it because so many of the shows that are on there, I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. I can't believe that we're, we're seeing this. Seeing Because there was a long time I didn't watch any TV when I was raising my kids, and then I forget what I watched, and, like, I was just in shock. And I shut it off, pulled the plug out of the wall, and said no more. Um, I think I cut the plug with some wire cutters. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's where we're at. Yeah, it's okay for them, but not for me. We've got to take, we take a short break. We've got more coming up with State Senator Christy Zitto. Uh, she's joining me, Bill Colley, this morning on Magic Valley This Morning on News Radio 96 1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com.
23 minutes exactly after 9 o'clock. It is 36. Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning. On News Radio 961 FM 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. But we're joined by State Senator Christy Zitto. And the district she currently represents geographically is going to be changing. She's got a sliver of Twin Falls County. We'll be losing her. And she'll be uh, moving more into the central highlands of the state, judging by the looks, the, if the map holds the way it is right now, the redistricting map. I got a, I got a, a short note for you because mainstream media, we were talking about how if you're a Republican and especially a, a more conservative Republican and the like, uh, you're, you're, you're treated as some sort of a domestic terrorist or enemy. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I hope media never gets a hold of this one. Uh, because Shellman tells me that you're his girlfriend and everyone knows he's already married. And uh, um, just to make clear, there's not actually, he's, he's joking. Speaking of jokes, he's he joking. He is joking. He is joking. <laughs> and I tell him that all the time. Nate, I'm old enough to be your grandmother. <laughs> so don't say that. But he keeps saying it and it's just a joke. And it, Did he just message you that just now? No, no, but he's mentioned okay. it in the past. <laughs> um Hey, speaking of this time of year, uh, there's always this notion that nothing's going on legislatively, but it's simply not true. I mean, you've got a, probably working right now on a list of priorities and getting things together for January, right? Oh, absolutely. Our session is short. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me how once we get into session, it, sometimes it feels like all of January we don't do anything. You know, I, and people have legislation ready. You work on it. And I know I'm not the only one, but we work on it from the time the session ends until we go back in January. And so, you know, a lot of us are prepared to hit the ground running when we get there. But there always seems to be this, you know, it's like this almost eerie feeling like you're walking down an empty hall and you're waiting for someone to jump out because things are somewhat quiet that first month. And, you know, I wish that when we get there, we would just go right to work on some of this stuff. We have some pretty serious issues that we're facing as a state, um, well, as a country, Bill. You know, th this mandate thing, this vaccine mandate and the push for this, just the fact that it's being pushed so hard, and I'm not anti-vax. I, You know, if that's what you choose to do, do it. I, I don't care. I mean, that's, that's your choice. Do your homework. Read all of the research, not just you know, what you're being said, but read it all and then make a decision. But for someone to force you to do that, and it's my opinion, you know, as, as a mom and a grandma and someone who reads the original intent of how, how things were planned, that is not the place of the government, especially on a federal level, to tell you what to do with your body. And I'm not so sure that even as a condition of employment, you know, I'll wear a hard hat and I'll wear steel-toed boots and I'll wear a bright orange um, vest or whatever I need to as a condition of employment. I'll be there at 6 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock or whatever time we agree on. But a condition of employment should be something you can leave at the door at the end of the day or when you terminate or separate from the job that you have, that's something you can leave at the door. These vaccines are not something that you can leave at the door. And I have personal knowledge of people who will never walk again of people who are deathly ill from the effects of this. And again, if, if you choose to do it, that's your choice. But you should never be mandated and required as a condition to pursue your happiness to do something like that. And I, I feel as a legislature that we should be addressing these things. We should be addressing these issues. And you know, we can sit and we can argue and we can back and forth and, well, you know, what will the governor sign? Because it takes, you know, a majority or 50% plus one in the House, 50% plus one in the Senate, and then we need the governor's signature. It, it's just beyond me how every legislator, every citizen in the state of Idaho, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on right now, is not concerned about what we're saying. Because, you know, if, if we're required to have a vaccine passport, to enter a store, to go to a sporting event, to buy groceries, to have the smart meter on your house turned on. And you may think that sounds far out there, but look where we've come in the last 18, 20 months. And, and these things, I, they're, I believe seeing how far and how fast we've come, these things could happen. 
those issues need to be dealt with in our autonomy as a, as a person and our sovereignty of a state as a state that needs to be protected. Got about a minute before the next break. Um, can you stick around through the beyond that? Yeah, I'm yours. And what are you done at ten? Yeah, I, but I, I know you got a farm to 10. run. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I told you I don't know whether I've been promoted or demoted, but I watch the grandkids and just drive truck or tractor when they're in a bind now. <laughs> well, I don't want to say you're retired. You certainly have a lot on your plate at the moment. So, <laughs> well, I, I think that's why you know I'm not I spend enough time on my legislative job that I'm not consistent enough to have my seat full time in the seat of a truck now. So Yeah. Well, we'll take a short break. We've got more coming up. And do want to mention that uh, we're talking with State Senator Christy Zitto. And her district currently covers all of Hawaii and Elmore counties and a, a small portion of Twin Falls County on the west side. Uh, that will be changing, obviously, with the redistricting. There is a map currently out that is being reviewed. We don't know exactly what, what that will look like, but if it holds... Her district will be more of an east to west district cutting across uh, the central highlands of Idaho. Got more on this on the way, in fact, uh, with Christy Zitto. Bill Colley as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX 96 1 FM and News Radio uh, NewsRadio1310.com. And I've got 36, so slight increase in temperature. It's 9 30. State Senator Christy Zitto joining us this morning on News Radio 96 1 FM 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 933. Bill Colley with you until 10 a.m. on Magic Valley this morning. And then Dan Bongino follows the news at 10 o'clock. Uh, Senator, I got a message from a Sean in Twin Falls. And uh, Sean says a 15 year old had a heart attack at St. Luke's. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't verify this, but this is what the writer tells me after taking the, the vaccine. Now, you have a post up on your Facebook page in the last few days, apparently after uh, what's been going on with the demands being made on staff there, the governor is now calling this, what, Health Care Worker Appreciation Month or something like that? Yes. Yep. And I told you when you asked me if we could talk about this, I would be hard-pressed to say anything nice. So forgive me in advance for having a sour attitude about this. Um, you know... These people have, for 18 months now, worked in the healthcare facilities, in our healthcare facilities, providing compassionate care, working their butts off, um, putting in long shifts. And now, and then they were told, you know, get the shot or take a hike. And granted, I think the, the deadline date was pushed back and stuff. Um, people that didn't want to get the shot had to beg for, um, a religious exemption or some other kind of exemption to not have to get this. And, you know, when your medical staff looks at something and they'll say, this is maybe not a good idea. I don't want this in my body. I think the rest of us should listen. And so for him to turn around and do this after, you know, putting National Guard in our hospitals and in our medical facilities and our, you know, state ran, I guess, or state funded um I, I hate I, doctor's offices or clinics or whatever, you know, and, and I, I get that, you know, they're not policing in those positions, but it's not a good sign either way, because in other states where there are school bus driver shortages, they're putting National Guard in school buses. Anywhere there's a worker shortage because of the mandate or whatever, they're putting National Guard and military to fill those positions. That is not a good thing. And I think it was an insult to the health care workers in the state of Idaho for the governor to do this. If the governor wanted to support our health care workers, he would have said no mandate. And, and all he would have to do is by executive order, and then we could legislate it when we got there, just like um, there was a piece of legislation run last year that was somewhat like this. If you choose to mandate this for your employees, you get no state funds, no state taxpayer dollars. It's that simple. And then they can decide. And so that would accomplish two things because the battle cry of the people who are supporting this huge pharmaceutical mandate 
that's raking in billions, not millions, but billions of dollars for the pharmaceutical companies because nothing is free. This shot is not free. Um, they say, well, you know, as good conservatives, we don't get involved in business. Well, I beg to differ because we have thousands of pages of IDAPA rule that businesses have to live by. You can't sell pumpkins in your front yard if you don't get a business license and pay um, taxes on that. And when you apply for a license, it's a tax. It's not a fee. They call it a fee, but every fee is a tax because that's money that goes into the state coffer, and you are begging permission to be in business. Then once you go into business, depending on what it is, there are regulations that you get to follow that are set forth by the state. And now explain to me, and I'm open to this discussion, explain to me how that is not government being right in the middle of business. And then you look at all these businesses that receive government subsidies. How many businesses wouldn't be in business if it weren't for that? Now, I get calls probably two or three times a week from people who are retired, and they say, if something isn't done about property tax, I am going to have to sell my house because I can't afford to pay the taxes on my home because they keep going up, and I'm on a fixed income. But St. Luke's and St. Al's, and I'm not sure what other medical facilities, they don't pay property taxes because they're supposed to be a charitable organization. Yet, they can afford to buy the most expensive properties in downtown Boise to continue to build bigger and better and fancier medical care facilities that my grandma, if she were alive today, wouldn't be able to afford because she couldn't pay the property taxes on her home. So let's get out of business. Let's let's get government out of business. No more tax breaks, no more nothing, no more money to anybody who wants to mandate a vaccine to their employees as a condition of employment. Well, you know, we got, we got about a minute before the break, uh, but uh, the next break. But, you know, Montana, which is not as red supposedly as Idaho, uh, Governor Gene Forty and his legislature stepped in and said, "This we're, we're not going to have vax mandates anywhere. Uh, in the workplace. <laughs> they can do it. How come we can't do that? We can. It's it's called intestinal fortitude. There's another word that I've heard kicked around, you know, that you have to have to make good stuff happen, but I'm not going to say it on the radio. <laughs> so we'll just go with intestinal fortitude. You have to have the guts to stand up and say, we're not going to do this. The other thing you have to do is you have to have the financial freedom. Now, I'm I'm told, and I haven't been able to check it out so I, I'm hesitant to say it, but I have been told that um, if these businesses that get a lot of federal money or any federal money, and maybe we could think back to the CARES money, if they don't comply with these federal mandates, they could lose that money. I, well, I haven't verified that, but I've been told that. Well, 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 we'll hold that thought for a moment. We've got more with State Senator Christy Zitto coming up. She'll be with us until the end of the program today. Also, uh, just around the corner, in fact, we've got Cal Thomas and his morning commentary. It's 36. We're at 940. Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. We're going to wrap up the program today with uh, Christy Zitto, State Senator Christy Zitto. It's 946. We're at 38. Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Do want to mention I'm off next week. I have uh, lots of vacation time, and I get to the point late in the year where I have to take it or lose it. So I'm taking next week off, although I will be moderating uh, the candidate forum for Twin Falls City Council seat one on Tuesday night at Eastside Baptist Church. At least that's the plan for now. And uh, my colleague Benito will be moderating uh, the forum at the same church for District 5 on Thursday night next week. So I just wanted to lay those things out. Uh, Hey, I got a question for you, Senator. This comes in from uh, Anna Workman. Uh, She's tuning in this morning, and she says, Ask Christy how the National Conference of Legislatures influences uh, the business of the legislature here in Idaho. Well, good morning, Anna. Um, you know, they, they do, all of these organizations have an influence, and there's a list that we put out here not long ago, and you can go to Growing Freedom Idaho and look at that, of 
the millions of dollars that are paid to all of these different organizations. And legislators go to these. Um, I've never been to that one. So they go to them and they talk about legislation and then they come back with ideas from these organizations that they go to. And it has a big influence. And, you know, I, I think that's another place where, as constituents, we should really be looking hard at these organizations, check out their website, see what their thoughts and ideas are, see if your legislator's going to it. And if they go to it, get on the phone with them or, or, you know, get in contact with them however you can. Go to their meet and greets. And, you know, if there's something in those legislative packages that you don't like, talk to them about it. Because I believe it does have a big influence on, on some of the legislators. I got I got to share something with you because we've got in the last few minutes I'm going to jump around a lot of different topics here. Uh, this is about 50 seconds long. It's a it's a soundbite from a parent of uh, school children in Loudoun County, Virginia, where they have critical race theory and they have the, uh, the the bathrooms for the confused kids to go into. And this woman grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution. There, I want you to listen to this for a moment. Hear what she has to say about how she's she's looking at the situation now where she lives here in the United States. When I was in China, I spent my entire school years in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So I'm very, very familiar with the communist tactics of how they divide people, how they cancel the Chinese traditional culture and destroy our heritage. And all this is happening here in America. Now they are labeling parents and concerned citizens like me as domestic terrorists, what that can do? You may lose your freedom. I do have a question. What's the next step? Is the Tiananmen Square crackdown the next? Would the parents one day risk their life just to speak up for the children? That's why I'm here. So this woman is talking about a situation that, while obviously it's 2,000 miles away from us, uh, we, we opened this conversation today talking about how mainstream media would like to portray your wing of the Republican Party as domestic terrorists. and uh, But th- there's there's an effort to try to paint people with these awful brushes, and I I don't know where it's coming from. The, you know, we've known each other for over 10 years, almost 15. I don't recall it being this way even 10 years ago. It wasn't this way 10 years ago, Bill. And, you know, what you just listened to from that woman is not specific to 2,000 miles away. It's happening every day in every city, every county, every state in this great nation. And for angry parents who go to a school board meeting to be labeled as domestic terrorists is wrong. And the reason these parents are so upset, Bill, is because for years now, they have been told they're not smart enough to know what it is their children need in their education. They've been told, you just give your kids to us by government-run schools, and we'll make sure that everything's okay. You don't, you don't need to be involved. We have Child Protective Services. We have the Department of Health and Welfare. We have all of these organizations that have slick names that make it sound like they have your child's best interest at heart that are going to tell parents why they're not qualified to raise their babies from the day they're born until they graduate from a public education system. And this is wrong. And this is what we're seeing is all this is is to scare you into compliance, to scare parents who care, to scare legislators who care, to scare anybody who's willing to stand up and have a voice and say, no, this is my family. This is my country. I believe in God. I believe in the higher good. I believe in those natural rights. They want us quiet, and they're going to use any means they can, the media, um, government enforcement officials, um, code enforcers, whatever you want to call it, to silence this. And threats like that should put the fear of God in every man, woman, and child in this state and in this country when parents cannot go angrily to a school board meeting You know, I think what prompted this, I heard the story on the news, and I can't remember where it was, that a father, his daughter had been raped in one of those bathrooms where you can go in there if you put on a skirt, no matter what your plumbing looks like, you can put on a skirt. and You don't even have to put on a skirt. You can just say, today I, I identify as this, and walk into these bathrooms. Well, his daughter was raped, 
and the school light board, I guess, from what I understand from the story, didn't acknowledge it. So he went to the school board meeting. If my daughter was raped or one of my sons were attacked in a bathroom in a school and something wasn't done about it, if one of my grandkids were touched, you can guarantee that when I went to that school board and they ignored me and made like it didn't happen, I would be just as angry as that dad was. And he had every right under God's son to be angry about what happened there. Now, is he a domestic terrorist or is he a father who loves his daughter and has a right to protect her? Here in Idaho, uh, we don't. We're, we're not quite nearly as bad yet as some of these places. But here's my imp- Im- impression. The reason the mainstream media is so angry with so many of you in your wing of the party is because mainstream media would like to be, I know, to be like Loudoun County, Virginia. The Democrats in the legislature here would like it to be like Loudoun County, Virginia. And even some Republicans would likely go that direction, too. And this is, you've become roadblocks to them, and uh, they're angry with you. And th- 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 I think they've reached that point where they want to rid themselves of you by any means necessary. Oh, absolutely. And they better damn well be scared of us because I can tell you that there are many people in this state that to their last breath will defend everything that's good and right. God, guns, babies, our basic freedoms. Bill, there's nothing more important, nothing at all more important than that. And I had a thought and then I got kind of wrapped up (laughs) emotionally and forgot what I was going to to say. But um, they, they should be scared of that. And it's unfortunate that we're at a place. And, you know, Bill, this is here. This is in Idaho. I don't know if I told you about an incident that happened in Glens Ferry School where a teacher made an assignment on white privilege, a writing assignment on white privilege. Well, the Glens Ferry School is, at, when I was on the school board, we were 67% ESL, English Second Language. These kids have grown up in this town together. They are colorblind. They don't care what race you are or what language you speak or how hard it is for you to speak English. Our special needs kids that go to that little school, they cheerlead, and they're in the homecoming royalty. And, and, and the, the, this little community has built this, this feeling of acceptance, and it's not just a feeling, it's what it is. Well, this teacher assigned a writing assignment on white privilege. And for, for two weeks, from what I'm told, maybe even longer, there was trouble because now suddenly someone had inserted this idea that because your skin is white, you are inherently privileged and racist. So I called the superintendent and I said, I want a copy of that curriculum. I want to know what's going to be taught the entire rest of the year. Number one, because I'm a grandparent. Number two, it ha- because people called me about it because I'm a legislator. He said, well, it's not in the curriculum. And I said, well, then why in the hell was it assigned? Well, the teacher chose to do that. So you might not read it in your curriculum, but just like these legislative councils and all of these things, you've got the National Education Association and the Idaho Education Association and all these other organizations, like we talked before, all of these organizations that have catchy names that sound like they're good for kids. Teachers don't have to have it in their in their um, curriculum because they, they can they have a lot of freedom to assign what they want. And we need to be conscious of what's being done in our classrooms. i got to let you run on that note, but I do want to thank you for taking the whole hour with us this morning. Oh, Bill, it's my pleasure. And, you know, we have been friends for a long time, and I'm so grateful for your friendship. I'm grateful for the people in this state, legislators and others, who are willing to stand up. We're seeing some great stuff in Twin Falls County and around the state, people finally saying no more. So God bless you all, and thank you for everything. We'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Take care now. You too. Bye. State Senator Christy Zitto joining us this morning. And uh, I said earlier she was in an undisclosed location. She lives in Hammett. <laughs> which I was just talking about the diner there earlier. And the reason I know the diner is good, I haven't been there to eat, is because she's told me that. We're at 38. It is 9.57. Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning. On News Radio 96.1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. God willing, if the creek don't rise, I'll be back in this chair one week from Monday. I'm taking next week off. Steve Millington will be filling in next week from 6 until 10 a.m. I do know that on Monday morning at least, and he'll have some additions to this, 
On Monday morning, he's got the Twin Falls County Commission at 7 o'clock, the Twin Falls City Council at 8 o'clock. And Tuesday morning, he's got a busy day as well. He's got Idaho State Police, and he's going to be joined by Twin Falls County Prosecuting Attorney Grant Lobes. Beyond that, the rest of the week is pretty much up to him. <laughs> so I, I'm going to sit back and just enjoy it, maybe sleep late, which for me is 4 a.m. Uh, in the meantime, Dan Bongino's up next. We're at 39 on nine. At, well, we've got 958, 39, and Bill Colley on News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com.